The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Vanguard Investments Australia Limited, ABN 7207288086, AFS22-7263, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Welcome to another Ensemble podcast series. I'm Tanya Carlson, financial advisor and owner of Amplify Wealth Management. And I'll be hosting this series where we explore how Australia retires. We have some great content to unpack brought to you by Vanguard, who conducted their 2024 research on how Australia retires, which included a cross selection of working and retired Australians, as well as an in-depth discussion with a talented and experienced financial advisor who specialises in retirees. Together, we will explore the current key insights and share some ideas that the advice community can explore further. Let's get started. Vanguard partners with advisors to give you and your clients the best chance for investment success. We support advisors with differentiated thought leadership, unique practice management ideas, high quality products and deep investment expertise. Our commitment is to help you, your clients, and your practice succeed long-term, aligning our mission with yours. Learn more at vanguard.com.au forward slash advisor. Hey, welcome to episode two. I'm Tanya Carlson, your host for the series, How Australia Retires. I'm a financial advisor and business owner of Amplify Wealth and have been advising clients for over 14 years. And today I will be joined by the very experienced and well-regarded financial advisor, Suzanne Hadan, MD for M- BFG Financial Services. Welcome to our discussion today, Suzanne. Thanks, Tanya. Great to be with you. Excellent. Well, I thought it might be a nice place to start if you would share a little bit about your background with our listeners. So, as you said, I'm a financial advisor with significant experience, in fact, over 30 years. And like you, I'm a business owner and uh, our practice is an accounting practice that specialises in financial advice and we give independent advice, which is great, and also mortgage broking. So, it's an area we love and an area I hope to be in for a while yet. Exactly. Well, it's uh, it's, it's been through a lot of changes, but uh, I think... Some of those changes have been for the better. Some of them have. Uh, I certainly believe our transition to what I believe is a profession is well underway and many of us have been in that space for quite some time. Some of the changes I think have been responsible for increasing the cost to consumers and some will say we bought that on ourselves, not individually but collectively but it certainly has made access to advice problematic for some of the community. Yeah, well, that's definitely one of our discussion points today. I I might pause that point and and come back to it if if we can. But um, what I think is interesting is that, you know, as as we're here to discuss today, Vanguard have produced this How Australia Tires report for the second year in a row. And... Mm -hmm. I think it's really important that as advisors, we discuss some of the changes that we see and some of the methodologies for retirees that we, I guess, provide advice on. But obviously, the trends that we see over time and some of those things are very indicative of the report itself. I guess a good place to start is probably around the current cost of living crisis. I'm not sure if you're seeing that with your clients and, and especially retirees. It's been interesting with retirees because over this cost of living crisis period, they in many respects have enjoyed increased returns, particularly on their defensive assets, uh, cash and term deposits. And also, as you'd be well aware, and I'm sure our listeners would be, that markets have been particularly kind in recent times. So for clients, for themselves, they seem to be coping quite well. They are particularly concerned about their children or grandchildren. 
about how they may be coping in this situation and also regularly asking how they might be able to assist uh, children and grandchildren with uh, coping in this period. Definitely. I think that's something we'll we'll talk about in a second. One of the things that um, was I thought was quite interesting in the Vanguard report was that the expected retirement income needs uh, for retirees increased by $10,000 a year. So this is what they expect they should have to be comfortable. And in fact, for, for working Australians, so for those who haven't yet retired, uh, it, it rose probably more significantly. So people who are working think that they will need more in retirement. I think that's quite reflective of this cost of living crisis and people trying to project forward um, on how they will manage in future sort of showed them believing that they need more money. Um, And I think it's quite interesting as well that retirees don't think they need, well, they do think they need a little more money, but not as much as those who are working, um, which which is, again, something that I guess it depends on what stage of retirement they're at. Retirees is quite a a broad term. It is quite a broad term. And as you know, we have people who are transitioning through different life stages and that doesn't necessarily mean full retirement. But Mm -hmm. what I'm noticing with clients who are retired, they have had some cost of living increases, but it's quite manageable. I mean, the issue with inflation is the basket is not representative of all groups, goods and services that they consume. So it's not necessarily going to affect people the same way and retirees are reflective of that. When you think about in CPI for the cost of um, accommodation, well, most of them uh, do own their own home, although that's a changing trend with home ownership rates reducing in many categories. And that's certainly a concern uh, for us when we're looking at people's financial plans. Definitely. One of the stats that came out of this that surprised me is that one in five retired Australians are renting their home. Now, you and I are both in Sydney, uh, mm. and, and I guess anyone who can afford to live in Sydney is, is probably considered affluent, even in you know certain areas of Sydney that may not um, feel that that's the case for them. So possibly we're seeing on a day-to-day basis more of those homeowner-type clients. Um, but interestingly, you know, a third of millennials um, and, and 45% of Gen, Gen Z, I say Z, it could be Z, sorry about that, people, um, they, you know, expect that they'll still be paying off a mortgage in retirement. So they're, they're feeling like they're never going to get on top of um, home ownership. And I know there's a few things we'll talk about today that where that may change, but I think that that's a real issue. And, and like you said, the retirees are worried about their children and they're worried about their grandchildren. Certainly, no, I know with my clients, they're worried about home ownership for those two categories um, in particular, let alone cost of living. Is that something that you're seeing? Uh, it is a very common question and concern that's raised around home ownership because a lot of our retirement systems and successful retirement is predicated on owning your own home. You know, for example, if you're going to be on an age pension, the rent assistance just does not, and the extra assets you can have, does not compensate for not owning a home, regardless of the lock, lack of um, security in not owning your own home. Age right. care also is another area that's favourably assessed if you own your own home. So for those clients, they've grown up in the, the retired clients, the era of home ownership, that's seen as a very foundational part of security in their finances, and to watch their children, predominantly their children in our case, but some grandchildren who that goal might not be met until inheritance hits the table is of concern to them. But one of the things I do say to clients is it's important to fit your own mask, then assist others, because we don't want to see our older clients doing without to accelerate the home ownership goals of the younger cohort who are still earning quite reasonable salaries and with some assistance from people like us and budgeting and other tools, may be able to make some life choices that might not be perfect for them, but could get them into their their first home. And again, maybe not the area they really want, but it's a start. You know, home ownership is a a ladder, not a a lift. (laughs) 
And I really, I like that term, actually, it's a ladder, not a lift, because, I mean, we, we find we often have that conversation with people where they say, oh, I'm not going to live in an apartment or I'm not going to, I want to be near mum and dad and that might be in an in, in a affluent suburb. And it's sort of having to remind them that, hey, when we started, it was, um, you know, it was some sort of something quite awful, probably. <laughs> and, and it wasn't necessarily the great suburb. A lot of the suburbs have been gentrified over time. And right. weren't the sought after suburbs 20, 30, or heaven forbid, 40 years ago. Also, the um, for home ownership, we do actually deal with a, a lot of young people in our practice because we have a family yeah. offering. So it's not available to the broader community, but we do have some of our newer financial advisors who see those young people. And yeah. we've been able to use strategies like the First Home Super Saver Scheme and other government supports and modify some of their goals and objectives and plans to get them into the first home. Maybe you need to have a border. Um, Maybe you need to be flexible and buy with a sibling. There's ways to get you started on that that ladder uh, without necessarily uh, dipping in and disturbing the financial security of parents or grandparents, which is always a concern to me. Well, absolutely. And and if we go back to the other wonderful... um, saying that you had there, which is fit your own mask first. I think this is really important when we talk about, you know, the great wealth transfer that's underway um, and the fact that, you know, as I mentioned before, some of these uh, younger generations are expecting that they will retire with a mortgage, but potentially this inheritance process will help alleviate or repay that debt um, at some point in time when they may um, be in receipt of an inheritance and nobody ever really wants to wish their parents away. Um, I also thought it was interesting in the report that they discussed the fact that most Australians believe that retirees should enjoy their hard-earned cash before giving, leaving an inheritance. (laughs) Yet we're we're sort of seeing, uh, well, I I see in my practice, and I think you've alluded to that as well, that whilst they say that, they're also, you know, sort of saying, oh, mum and dad, you enjoy your money, it's your hard-earned money with the handout, you know, sort of at the same exactly. time saying the words but yeah. actually um, certainly hoping for some sort of help. And like you mentioned, the retirees are very concerned about their children, their grandchildren getting into housing and being able to afford. So they're wanting to bring forward these sort of living legacies where they may be able to gift money. What do you do or how would you – go about in your practice helping clients understand the decision of giving some money now versus leaving it as legacy? You know, like with most things, I think it's interesting you say with that outcome for the Vanguard survey, I wonder if they were concerned there was a camera on them because we certainly see most seem to want to have some support from the bank Mm. of mum and dad. For us, it's all about modelling and Mm. building in the client's uh, goals and plans and objectives and showing them the outcome of decisions. It's not about us saying whether you should do it or not. It's making sure your client is empowered with the information to be able to make an informed decision because then, then it's on them because you have clearly explained that you do X, it will affect your retirement outcome this way. So it might mean your money will run out when you're 87. Are you okay with that and maybe accessing your home? So that's how we handle it. We don't want to look like the the Grinches that don't want to uh, support young people on their journey. But we also want to make sure clients understand when they give up capital, that capital is gone and they won't be asking the client, the children for the money back. And we also take that attitude when they're saying they're lending it to the client. Because let me tell you, the first repayment that stops is from children if they get into financial distress. The parents okay? wear, wear it, not the kids. I, I have seen that so many times. So I say, mm. yep, your kids might pay you something, but I would budget into your decision making that you get nothing. And that's a safer one hundred for them. Yeah. Mm. yeah, I agree with that as well. And we do the same. I think it's really important for for clients to really visualise, you know, the situation that their children are going to be in and and just knowing that they can get away with it with mum and dad means they just do. And then Um, you find out they've gone to Fiji. It's really quite horrific, isn't it? 
Wait, and pretty your clients have, pretty your clients have gone to the Central Coast Caravan Park. <laughs> Correct, correct. You know, that's exactly, uh, I think, where the differentiation comes in. So I think it's really important that um, that advisors really make that clear distinction to their clients. And even if there is a contract in place, which we would always encourage, I'm sure you do as yes. well, um, in, in the event of separation, that there's something formal in place to protect the family that's, I was going to say, loaning, but it's probably gifting the money. Well, the other thing that we do, and I had a case recently is sometimes the children are already in their property, have the mortgage, but interest rates are up, so the squeeze is on. So we discussed, rather than giving a lump sum to reduce the debt, maybe um, a monthly amount, and let's set it for 12 months to help them with their loan repayments. Now, the reason- great idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The reason you do that is, number one, it's not a big draw on the client's capital. Number two- it still gives fiscal discipline to the children because when you pay off their loan, they can redraw, redraw that to replace their car or whatever personal expenditure you do. Once it's gone, you can't monitor it. Also, we say set it for six months or 12 months so the client isn't locked into a perpetual support because circumstances will change, interest rates can change, and I'm not in, I don't believe clients have to give money without having an understanding of the kids' circumstances. And so having that conversation again to say, right, where are we up to? How did you go? Do you need support? And the client can make a decision to give some additional support if they want to. Yeah, I really love that, actually. I think that's really important because it it could potentially stop them holidaying in Fiji and actually using that money where it needs to go to, so to provide that buffer. Um, And it's probably easier to to have an ongoing how is how are you managing things is everything okay because they may get a bonus or something at work or change jobs Correct. in which case it, it prompts the um the retiree the the ability to sort of say well sh- should I stop paying at the moment or or in fact if the economic conditions change or the the retiree client's return changes mm-hmm. um, that they may also sort of say look maybe I need maybe I need to reduce it a little bit is not possible um, because, as you say, when, even when we model these capital withdrawals, uh, that really does impact a big lump sum of money going out is going to impact everything. Yeah, and people are living longer and mm. younger younger clients coming through in their 50s and early 60s often think, oh, well, I'm, I make it to my late 80s, but you can't use life expectancies. More than half of people no. are going to go past that. And do you yes. want to be in your 90s and not be able to provide for your own care and have choices available to you for care, whether it's retirement living or aged care? So they do have to look after themselves too. Yeah, no, I really agree with that. It comes back to that fit your own mask. But it's a, mm-hmm. it's a challenging conversation because emotions are getting in the way when it comes to our children. Most parents want the best for their children um, and often prioritise that over and above their own situation, um, both when they're working and when they're not. And the last thing we want to hear a client say is, Suzanne said you can't have the money. (laughs) We definitely want them to take ownership of their gifting and support decisions, notwithstanding a lot of the younger people are clients as well. So Awkward. Well, that's true. Yeah, definitely. I'm sure we've all been thrown under that <laughs> bus a few times, though. <laughs> Absolutely. Fair enough. Well, look, another thing I thought was interesting that came out of this survey was that one in two Australians don't know if their money will last their lifetime um, in retirement. And one in two don't know how much they can spend each year to make their savings last. What are your thoughts on that? And again, how are you addressing these sorts of things with your clients? Well, I certainly think we can put our hands up and say the ones that see a qualified financial advisor are very clear on that situation. Mm. I I'm a big believer of early engagement with clients. We prefer our clients to um, be with us on their life's journey, not just on an event-driven uh, episodic thing like retirement. And so for our clients, we've been stress testing their assets against their goals and likely outcomes to be able to clearly articulate how long we think their money will last. And that enables 
us to be able to identify any gaps and give solutions. So for right. some clients, they may have invested significant capital. And as you say, we're both in Sydney, particularly in the Sydney property market, that massive millions of dollars are tied up in their own home. And they are very comfortable to travel, spend and enjoy. Once I've explained, right, I think this pool of money will last to your at least 87. Mm -hmm. And, And I say, at that point, what are you going to do? And we talk about, they say, no, we are absolutely prepared to release capital from our house and another million dollars, and enjoy it again. And so then they can comfortably enjoy their retirement. But remembering most of our clients are ongoing clients. So we're, they're checking in, we're having our reviews. So they're, they're on the plan, they know they've got the money, they know they can do what they set out to do. We always understand unintended expenses or unplanned expenses come up, mm. but that's why you use conservative estimates in your modellings so you get a bit of a bit of fat, bit of buffer in the buffer. strategy. Yeah, mm. great. Yeah, no, I think that's really important. It's very interesting, again, that in their um, report, and this is something that I spoke about in the last episode, that... Um, Clients had set their retirement age at, say, 65, but many retired earlier. And I guess there was also data demonstrating that advised clients were more confident about their situation, how much they could spend, how long their money was going to last. As you said, it's been modelled for them probably for many, many years. Uh, and so that's something that they're they're aware of. And we, we noticed with our clients, we've actually had a number of clients, and in fact, I now often laugh when people say, oh, I'm going to work till I'm 65, especially as they get closer to 60, um, because once they start to have some confidence that they have enough funds for their proposed income needs, it's very interesting to me that we often see people retire earlier than they think. So people have a false expectation, in my opinion, of when that when mm-hmm. they will stop working. And it's often earlier, not later than than what they expect. Do you see that as well, Suzanne? Um, absolutely. And I'm sure you do this too. We, through the uh, life journey with clients, we identify when we say you've reached financial independence. True. And many just keep working. They might reach that at 50, might be 55, whatever the date is. And then some clients decide to have a transition phase. Some clients decide yep, I don't want that high-powered job I'd like to. I had one that in, in their 50s changed and got a teaching qualification and, and did teaching rather than a very wow. high-paid executive job. What it does, it empowers the client to make other life decisions because their finances are in hand. Mm-hmm. And we think that's fantastic. We've had some that go gone to charities, sometimes yes. pay, but charities aren't your big payers. So they've yeah. taken significant drop-in salary to do something that, they feel they're really contributing. They might have been an engineer. They might have been doing a great job somewhere else, but they want to do something different. Also, things can happen in their lives that are beyond their control. So I've had clients that are financially independent, but they've been made redundant. And as distressing as that is, it is certainly less distressing if we've been able to say, but you're okay financially. Go and look at that next job that you want. You can be covered in the meantime. And uh, that gives them a lot of confidence with their life, with their life choices. Also, health can impact clients, yes. depending, particularly if I don't have a, my, most of my clients are professionals rather than a physical job, but the few in physical jobs, whether it's in the care industry or police or whatever, um, sometimes it's quite a demand on their bodies to stay in those roles, to, to be, have a bit of flexibility. The other thing I would say that what people earn is not the major determinant of achieving financial independence. It's what they save and invest. Some of my most successful clients have been on moderate to good incomes, been been great budgeters and um, been stuck to the plan, had realistic goals and then could make those choices much early in their later years to opt out of the, um, the workforce, which is great. Yeah. I really, I really believe in that too. I think it's not. Um, it d- doesn't mean you need to be earning a high income. It's how you manage your money um, on that day to day basis that really reflects that long term uh, situation. So you know, I think that's really helpful. So we mentioned um, a little bit about um, 
some of the barriers to entry. And I know we talked a little bit about the the changes to our industry mm. and working towards a profession and the fact that um, the cost of advice has risen. I think there's a number of factors um, that have contributed to that. And, and num- number one is supply and demand. I mean, there's literally, you know, 10,000 or, or more 12,000 less advisors in existence now than there was five years ago. And yet we're entering the stage where a big cohort of, of baby boomers are moving into retirement. Um, if they haven't already done so, uh, that, that wave is underway. So there's a significant, it is an event, I guess, that is known for needing advice. Um, but what else do you see as some of the barriers to seeking advice or not having a plan? Is there anything that you've got some thoughts on around that? I think for, I think you've hit the main one is there's just not the number of advisors to serve the community's needs. And I absolutely agree that cost also is the next inhibitor, but I would suggest to you that most of us, our books are pretty full. Mm, that's with, true. And we, I know in our practice we're working hard to bring through provisional advisors to have that next cohort, but I still yes. think it's the availability of advisors first and second uh, is the, the cost issue. And people don't know where to, to go because unless you have a these days, I believe, um, some sort of uh, connection with a financial advisor, it's getting trickier to mm. get in for an appointment. I know in our firm, we only work on personal referral. Right, correct, yeah, and we we very much try to leave the spaces for the family of our current clients to access our services. And, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, so we do have some people coming from other other sources, but um, mainly personal referrals. So where where do people where do people go? And we certainly don't want to go back to the bad old days that you could certainly get advice, but the quality of it mm, was not up to scratch. Yeah. And um, that's why I'm a little concerned with how yeah you know, the next legislative steps are taken to well, to broaden the yeah. access. Uh, yeah. Let's not it's have history concern. repeating itself. No, we, 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 well, I think we've seen a, a, a real shift and, a, and an uplift in the inequality, and you know that that is demonstrating um, this this lack of uh, supply uh, and the fact that at most advisors, I don't really know any advisor that's not run off their feet. Um, you know, we're not at a situation that you are in terms of ref- accepting referrals only, um, but I think it's always fascinating where those referrals come from and uh, and the ways that people, um, you know, refer nowadays by social media. It was also really interesting that um, one of the statistics was that almost half of all Australians access retirement information and guidance from Google, Facebook, Reddit. I thought that that was uh, amusing and terrifying all in, all in one. A bit like um, their medical, <laughs> Dr. Yeah. Dean. <laughs> That's correct. Dr. Google and Advisor Google. Um, and look, obviously, I think in future technology and AI will, will play a part of, of what we would probably call general advice. Um, what are your thoughts on, on the people that are potentially seeking retirement information from Dr. Google or, or any of those other methods? I think the accessing of information is not a problem. Mm. The problem is what to do with it and how to interpret it and how to apply it to your own personal circumstances. We deal in a very highly complex environment and relating to tax, to Centrelink, to aged care, to investments, to super rules. And trying to bring that all together over the internet would be challenging. However, I think... AI and robo-advice and that sort of technology can fill the void for what's perceived to be simple advice. But what's perceived to be simple advice can have significant implications if that is done incorrectly. You know, for example, it can be seen simple to save for your own home using the first home super saver scheme, but not if you have put that money in and not 
take it out for a few years, but this year you're not working and the year you take it out, you're going to be full-time earning seventy or 80000 and there might be tax yes. implications. So what can appear simple doesn't always you know, end up that way and that's yeah. the danger. I think uh, AI will be a great tool yeah. for us in our practice. I don't think the risks are as high for those of us who are giving that very personal high touch face to face and but over Zoom as well type advice. Mm-hmm. I think there's certainly it will fill a bit of a void for the one off basic episodic advice and also for where people might Google for what to invest in. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that and I, I think most people would. I think there's a place for it and a need for it. Um obviously it's early days in that space and We've been seeking technology coming to our rescue um, in in various ways for many years, and it never quite seems to be the answer that I think everyone expects it to be. Uh, so I think that there's always a need for personal advice. I always say to to my clients, the world is becoming more complex, not less. So I can't imagine that you know a simple solution is going to um, create the outcome that people are hoping that it will. No, I Um, I would agree with that. I mean, navigating through the complexities of people's financial affairs is difficult. And there's a reason that we are all so highly qualified and specialised in this space so that we can uh, guide our clients through those decisions to get the best outcomes for them. Yeah, exactly. One of the things that Vanguard, um, I guess, focused a little bit on was superannuation and the fact that there was a a real lack of engagement, even with retired clients, with their superannuation, understand, would be liaising with their fund. I think the the statistics showed that people were not communicating with their fund at all. And if they were, it might be once a year. Uh, Obviously, those who were advised were uh, actually communicating more and understood the fees that they were paying in their super fund versus people who weren't advised, which makes sense. But one of the things that I think is complex for us as advisors, let alone clients, is it is very difficult to compare apples with apples in that space. Mm -hmm. Um, Is there anything that you talk to your clients about in in regard to that? So I absolutely agree with you that advised clients, our, our clients are very across their fees because of the way we present it, they can see who's being paid what and for what. Yes. The transparency issue, we're not a lover of funds where we can't see correct valuations and pricing. If it's opaque, we wouldn't use it. Yeah. Clients have to be very careful if they are comparing super funds, for example, that they're comparing like risk because I often mm-hmm. see what's called balanced is not what I call balanced. Balanced yes, is fifty right. fifty. Vanguard's balance fund is balanced. Most yes. of the others are growth because they can have sixty, seventy percent in growth assets. I don't know what planet people think that's ba- balanced. So when well, people are word, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's it's a little misleading if you use that term. But but um, I mean, balance to me does mean half half. But yeah, um, me too. Yeah. So when clients are comparing a balanced fund. They have to make sure they're comparing the same risk profile because, as we know, high risk, you'd expect a higher return. The other thing they have to be aware of um, assets, whether they're private assets or unlisted property, always for the valuations, the timing of the valuations and that transparency. So they're not conversations we need to have excessively with clients. It's more conversations we would see with new clients so that they can understand the process. I mean, I don't want to name particular funds, but I had a client in a certain industry and said, oh, no, I'm told this industry fund does does really well. And he compared it. But one fund has reported up to the end of the January and the other one's the end of the April. So straight away you had uh, a misunderstanding. So clients don't generally find it as interesting as us. And when you're also not interested in it and it's complex, then danger, danger when they're trying to do their own self-analysis of the the superannuation fund of choice. 
Yeah, and I think this is one of the barriers um, to advice and and to people having a successful retirement um, because we've just demonstrated very quickly, as as most advisors can, um, how how complex superannuation is and how um, comparing funds can be really challenging. Oh, it's absolutely difficult for clients under there, for most clients, to be able to compare and make sure they're doing you know like for like with uh, product. We have to concentrate to work out what's going on with some of these funds. How on earth do we expect clients to be able to do that and uh, correct, come up yeah. with the necessary the right decision? And understanding asset allocation and risk profiling, I mean, they're, they're things that we would undertake on their behalf. It's not like a, an everyday person is going to sort of say, oh, I know I'm this risk profile and I love this al- asset allocation. I understand unlisted assets. It's just too too much for people. And I think, I mean, my personal opinion is that people actually lose a little bit of interest. Superannuation is a, a long-term investment. Um, they can't touch it. They can't touch and feel it on a day-to-day basis. Possibly as they're getting closer and their balance is growing, they start to feel a little more pride in that. Um, but And certainly if they're an engaged client um, on a regular sort of basis where that tracking and accountability is going to be discussed with them. But I think for people that might dip in and out of advice even, um, and we've probably seen an increase over the years in those sorts of people, um, they're possibly missing opportunities. One of the interesting things was that I think it was, uh, you know, one in four working age people, and, and admittedly with the younger you, you know, cohort, you may not um, be surprised by this, but they're not expecting or planning to make additional contributions to super. And in fact, I think 27% or, or so on um, who are closer to retirement weren't planning to make contributions to super, and that surprised me. That's that, And that is a concern, particularly with younger, and I sort of say under the the forty year olds. Yeah, um, quite often in that gambit, we'd be generally concentrating on their mortgage. But you look at co contributions where they can get a fifty percent return from the government, or spouse contributions. You know, five hundred and forty dollars. Spouse super splitting is a yeah. great way. I I treat superannuation as a family asset, so. Whoever, and often, quite often the woman having parental leave to be able to equalize the super. It's good to equalize super from a whole range of reasons, but also it minimizes your legislative risk uh, with yep. um, balance limits and those sorts of things. To engage people in their super, we have to be able to show often to the younger ones an advantage outside of their super. So yeah. when um, clients, we're not a believer that you have to have your mortgage fully paid off to start the journey of, um, say, salary sacrifice or personal super contributions, the yeah. financial outcomes speak for themselves. We know how significant that is for you know, reasonable, moderate to high income earners. And so long as the mortgage is in hand, then being able to start a bit of regular topping up with the, the super so there's advantages to both, whether they salary sacrifice or do the personal concessional. With the personal concessional contribution, there's general excitement when they get their tax refund. <laughs> and in this case, isn't it? In this case, it's not because we've negative geared and made them a loss. They've actually no, yes. put the money into super. So, in. But the danger with it is they've got to be disciplined to have the money to contribute. If I think there's any risk of that, I like I like them to start with a bit of salary sacrifice. Even it's fifty dollars a week or a hundred. Yeah. We all know the power of uh, regular contributions, um, and that's what we like to see once their mortgage is in hand. But Great. so so many of the life events for yeah. people are starting later now. Whether it's partnering up, whether it's you know having children, starting yeah. their mortgage. Everybody's just much later now. Agreed. It's pushing yeah. pushing out some of these other wealth decisions and um, quite a large proportion of money is going into to homes. And we kind of feel sometimes people go into their home, it's their haven, they get close to paying it off and they upgrade it. So we're thinking, oh, yes. we're thinking putting a bit of money in super as well Maybe yeah. um, you, you sort of uh, clients that for 30 years ago would be in their home and say, well, that's where I am. Yes. 
Whereas now we see that's where I am, but now I'm going to go and get another property, right, a bigger, a bigger home home to this the better, area, yeah, or a holiday home, or a, a second home. Yeah. Yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's interesting, and I think that's definitely true. I think we're seeing people invest in their home. We often remind people that your home is a lifestyle asset. Uh, yes, there's equity there to be released if um, if you need to go into care or downsize in future, but. Um, I agree. I think it's really important to understand the people that have the discipline to make those member contributions or those personal contributions and those that aren't so disciplined that really need or savings or regular um, something happening automatically that salary sacrifice is appropriate. It also creates uh, a habit. And, you know, I, I believe that creating habits, you know, if, if you know Tuesday is gym day, then on Tuesday you go to the gym. So if you're putting fifty dollars, um, you know, a week into super, and it's automated, it's done. But the, the review may come around, and we might say, "Oh, how do you feel about pushing it up to seventy five? So these increments are really important too. Exactly, trying to get money off them before they get it. And I'm very transparent yeah. with clients as to what my goal is. I said I've identified you as a bit of a spender, so I think we need to maybe take it regularly before you see it. And right. yeah. And then the other element of that is you need to show them the outcomes yeah. of that decision. So, so yes. look where you where your super, you know, is up to. Back to your your home issue, I say to clients like you, it's a lifestyle asset, and I say you can't sell the bathroom, and you don't want to be entering retirement with a lack of liquidity, and that's what direct property investment creates, whether it's your home or investment property, it creates a lack of liquidity and that can impact on them enjoying their retirement to its fullest. Yeah, I agree with that. And and actually that brings me nicely to some of the retirement fears that I guess we'll finish up on today. And and you'll you'll none of these will be any surprise to you because I think they're the fairly standard um Retirement fees. We talked a little bit before about running out of money, um, and again, mentioned that obviously, if we're regularly modelling this for our clients, we're giving them confidence on how long their money's lasting. If they're gifting some to children, what the impact of this is. So they're making informed decisions. Um, I think retired Australians are very concerned about health issues, and that probably ties into our home conversation and what could happen if their health starts to decline and whether they could release equity in their home or, or downsize or, you know, f- use the home as a funding mechanism to enter care, should they need that? Is that something that you bring up with your clients um, yes. early or regularly or how, how do you go about that? We do we do bring it up. Uh, not wouldn't surprise you it's more to older clients as an, and you've got to be careful with defining older clients because health journeys are very personal. But once we can see the likelihood of uh, aged care choices, we certainly are looking and discussing that with clients and having a bit of chat about uh, funding. The trickier ones we find are when the journey is um, deterioration of cognitive, so dementia or the like, because... We try to have that discussion really early for them to talk to their family about what they want while they're cognizant to do so. And then it hits a point that family members also join the journey. It's interesting though, most of, I've got lovely clients and and the families are lovely and most of them are great wanting the best outcome for mum and dad. We do occasionally hit the impatient inheritors or the ones that want to keep the, the family home intact because you know, it sort of locks it up ready for the inheritance and mum yes. will be okay in that substandard place a <laughs> couple yes. of suburbs away. But that's not, not the norm. But we're very oh, conscious yes. to watch out for any elements of um, elder abuse. Um, but certainly we model how we're going to fund life changes like like aged care. The most popular one I'm seeing at the moment is there is quite a lot of, they call it downsizing, but I'm not necessarily seeing people downsize. I'm seeing them swap. Yeah. Very much in their late 50s, 60s is my main catchment area and um, getting out of the family home, going into uh, 
maybe waterfront or whatever uh, apartment. So we say downsizer, but it, it's really swapping or upside uh, up scale. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Same same price bracket, but um, but you know, obviously more suitable to uh, a couple lifestyle, for example, where perhaps it's. Smaller, but uh, but far more luxurious. So I'm getting rid of the bedroom so the kids can't actually come back. Well, it's a great move. Actually, I might have to try that myself. <laughs> I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> well, no one wants to clean five bedrooms if only you know one are being used. I guess right. <laughs> or clean two if they come back. <laughs> well, that's true. That's yeah. That definitely gets inherited, doesn't it? Um, so look, I think that's that's definitely something that. That we see, and 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 in those affluent areas like Sydney, where that's um that's possible for people to do that. We've had clients that have moved out of Sydney to release equity and fund their lifestyle too. So to moving to other more rural areas, um, they've got a really nice, uh, you know, comfortable paced lifestyle. Things slow down a little bit. It's not so rushed. There's certainly no traffic, um, and you know, probably walk everywhere and all those sorts of places, and that really freeze up some of their equity in their home from Sydney. We uh, we don't deal with a lot of Centrelink clients, but the ones we deal with are very conscious of those releasing capital from the home and the effect on Centrelink. And I think the sad part is that sometimes they can't get their mind beyond that and it limits yes. their lifestyle choices and full enjoyment of, of their funds. But we yeah. have also seen clients move out of, of Sydney yeah. uh, to have a, a different lifestyle and to be very happy with their choices. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think, you know, the Centrelink clients, you're right. I mean, some of them get very um, focused on retaining as much as possible, almost like the tax clients who want to avoid paying tax as much as yeah. possible, where, you know, in, in some cases, um, paying a little more tax is a good sign it means you're earning more money. We never um, go broke making a profit. It's definitely true, isn't it? And I think the same can be said with, with, with Centrelink in a way that it, it, if you're able to then fund your own life for a period of time at least or, or partially, um, that's a great opportunity and, and represents much more freedom of choice in, in my opinion. Mm, mine too. Yeah. Sometimes they attach that, um, and it's more the very elderly clients yes. that the dollar yes. of Centrelink is somehow more valuable than a dollar of interest. It's yeah, it's it, it's a funny thing, and I do think it is. It comes from um, maybe generational behaviour of, yes. of watching parents that had to rely on that. There wasn't other options like superannuation and and so on, um, and a sense of entitlement to the government Absolutely. will after me when I'm retired. Yeah, and that's and that's definitely one of the um, retirement fears: not having the age pension or changes in the government pension, and I think um, not being able to pay for unexpected expenses. Again, we've probably addressed. A lot of those issues today by the fact that advised clients will be getting that information modelled to them and spoken about on a regular basis so they know where they're tracking, they know where their buffers are, they know the options if they need to downsize or move into care or provide for children or grandchildren, what the impact is to them, which is which is really powerful. So is there anything else that you feel is is worth mentioning that you're doing with your clients or, or anything that you're seeing, any trends that are, are sort of showing themselves more regularly uh, nowadays? I think uh, what we are seeing is once again that power of the building engagement with clients and the seamless transfer through to life stages, including retirement. Think of asset allocation and how that needs to be massaged as years go by and needs are different. With advised clients, it's just moving through. They already understand product. They understand their tax outcomes. The retirement is more seamless. So I would encourage everybody, even if they're not quite as profitable, to try and engage clients as early as possible in the journey. Yeah, I agree. I think it's a really great experience and, and it's rewarding for advisors, isn't it? I mean, it's a wonderful yeah. feeling when you see your clients um, move towards the stages that they want at their choice. So they, this is, you know, situations where it's not driven by a, a health event or something unfortunate, but they're making these decisions. Um, they're having conversations. It's a real celebration and it is an achievement. Um, it's wonderful to hear how they're spending their time. We're often hearing that phrase, I've never been busier. Um, yes. What did I, what, how did I ever fit work in? So I think 
Um, there's a lot to be said by some of the behavioural coaching that comes with working with a client on a line. I think that's what you might be referring to when you're sort of massaging risk profile. You're, you're massaging them into thinking about what what changes will occur in their life and how they're going to be dealing with that and making sure that they're emotionally ready for that change. And I think the emotional part, we can make sure that their finances and they're all set up ready to go. They still have that emotional step to take and that's more about when retirement is full. I think the transition steps, we're seeing more and more clients transition have the two or three days work rather than the five. I think that is a trend I see more and more or often go out and consult. And most of us know consulting is best done when you don't really need the money because of the big exactly. thing. And yeah. they can still say they're doing something, but they're on that journey. I often say to clients, when do you know that you, 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 you're there? And they say, you just yeah. know, you've had enough. Yeah. But it's yeah. still confronting. Yeah, yeah fantastic. No, I agree. It's been wonderful talking with you, Suzanne. You've got a lot of great insights. I can tell you're incredibly well regarded and experienced because you've got some really great ways of phrasing these things and and talking with your clients. So uh, hopefully all the advisors listening uh, from now on will will, um, be able to engage some of those points that you mentioned. And for those that are interested, please look up Vanguard's report, How Australian... Australians Retire 2024. I think it's got some really valuable insights as well. Thanks, Tanya. 